In Britain, healthcare is free at the point of use, and it's pretty popular. The NHS, fabulous! Every week I'm here! Mind you, that's why the idea is more... contentious. Yet back in Britain, politicians of all stripes have tried to claim credit for the NHS. We have earned the right to call ourselves the party of the NHS today. The National Health Service is Labour's proudest creation. But the NHS does not belong to a single political party. We created the NHS. It is the NHS that has benefited from Conservative policies and Conservative government. All political parties say the same, but not all political parties are the same. Uh, so... How did Britain get the NHS, one of the world's first universal healthcare systems? Well, it wasn't easy. To find out how, we'll have to go back to the 1940s. See a post-war election that kicked out the victor? And meet a fiery Welshman who remains Labour's greatest hero. No, this Welshman would never take a knighthood. I was younger, I grew up in a, in a valley, which is a coal mining valley. Hmm. Closer, but I'm afraid this inurance better looking. We shall lead our people to where they deserve to be led. That's the one. Also, mild spoilers for Red Dead Redemption 2? No longer servant and no longer The answer is we're out. Elections generally, with Alex and Michael. Part 1. Healthcare before the NHS. Before the NHS, Britain didn't really have a healthcare system at all. There were two kinds of going to the doctors. GPs, who'll cut you a prescription. And hospitals, who'll cut you open. How? Manual workers and the low paid have been able to see a tax funded GP since 1911. As could anyone with TB. Yet eligibility didn't extend to workers' families. As most women weren't formally employed, access to healthcare was heavily gendered. The situation for hospitals was just as patchwork. Britain's near 3,000 hospitals were divided between local authorities, private owners, and importantly, charities. This uncoordinated system of hospitals meant that the medical treatments you could access depended very much on where you lived. But look, on yonder horizon, the granddaddy of central planning himself, Sir William Beveridge. Part 2 The Beveridge Report. Hello. The year is 1941, and the war is not going well. However, Britons do not lose hope. Here comes noted genius and eugenicist William Beveridge with a report on what life will be like after the war for common folk, if we win. The report said that... Michael! Michael! Oh, hey there, my socially distanced co-host. What's up? You can't just read out the beverage report. You've got to think of the kids, man. The kids! Oh, I could sing it. No, you can't. Can you do a, a let's play? Fine. Alex thinks I'm out of touch. But I know what the streamers are playing. The Nintendo Entertainment System. Oh, one player. London, 1941. Cabinet meeting. Mr. Churchill. Must we? It'd be very expensive. Clement Attlee, Deputy Prime Minister. We must give the British people something to fight for. Fine. Send for Beveridge. He seems a liberal and not one of your lot. Beveridge sent for me? Yes. Five giants are plaguing the nation. Want, squalor, ignorance, disease, and idleness. And you must defeat them all. <gasps> Social security must be achieved by cooperation between the state and the individual. The state should offer security and service for contribution. And I am ready to contribute. Ooh, it's getting good. Right, here we go. It's level one. Okay, we're in a hospital. I wonder if it's a voluntary hospital. Oh, it's quite slow. And I guess he was 66 when he wrote the report, so... Ah, goodness sake. Right, jump. Ah, take that, you coronavirus-looking... Mob. Oh. Okay. Oh. Jump. 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 <gasps> He's got popular support. What? It's the giant of disease. Quick, point and pen. Point and pen. Spam point and pen. Uh. Oh, that's pretty ingrained. My goodness. Ooh, a red box. That'll contain a recommendation. Let's see it. 
There shall be separation of medical treatment from the administration of cash benefits and setting up of a comprehensive medical service for every citizen, covering all treatment and every form of disability under the supervision of the health departments. While vague on detail, this recommendation was the germ of Britain's future NHS. Naturally, Labour loved the Beveridge report. The Conservatives, on the other hand, were more wary. His plan would greatly expand the state and sounded expensive. Ultimately, the coalition partners compromised. The report would be published, but nothing would be implemented until the war was over. And it was a hit! The newspapers widely praised the report, with a few exceptions, and the public were eager to see it implemented, hoping it would prevent a repeat of the economic crisis that had followed the end of World War I. In 1944, responding to the popularity of the report, the Health Secretary, Conservative Henry Willink, published the government's first attempt at working out what free at the point of view's healthcare would actually look like. The Willink report is the Conservatives' main basis for claiming a stake in the creation of the NHS. So let's look at it. Under Willing's proposals, the Secretary of State for Health, from the ailing public's perspective, for rational KPIs, is a Got it? Ooh, should probably get that looked at. The convoluted structure of Willing's proposals stemmed from Tory reluctance to tinker with the existing health system. That reluctance stemmed from an ideological opposition to government involvement in healthcare. Essentially, they were trying to satisfy public support for beverage while actually changing as little as possible. This means that while the Conservatives had accepted the principle of free at the point of use healthcare, the actual system they were proposing was very different from the nationalised, nationwide healthcare system the NHS would become. And even these more modest reforms were unpopular for the medical establishment. And, per the Coalition Partners' Agreement, nothing could actually be implemented until after the war was over. Hey, hey wait, you're not doctors. Where are we going? Part 3, the 1945 general election. The war's over! <laughs> Allies win! Or rather, the war in Europe's over. The war in Japan is still ongoing. But hey, that, that's far away. It's election time. The different manifestos outlined... Let's play. Let's play. For pity's sake. Okay, let's go. 1945. You know, there nearly wasn't an election in July 1945 at all. Churchill liked being head of a large coalition, so proposed a referendum on extending the coalition until after Japan surrendered. Attlee refused, saying that referendums were alien to British national life and too often the tool of despots and fascism. Labour got off to a strong start, with a manifesto focused on new houses, nationalising industry and a prosperous peace. It was super beveragey. But the Conservatives were more cautious. Their manifesto focused on foreign policy and preserving the empire. It wasn't popular. Seeing he was falling behind, Churchill gave the so-called Gestapo speech broadcast, which claimed that Attlee would require some kind of secret police to implement his socialist plans. It backfired. Attlee had been Churchill's partner during the war years. The idea he wanted a secret police now was absurd, if not offensive. To add insult to injury for Churchill, when the armed forces vote came in the weeks after the election, it broke heavily for Labour. The result? A Labour landslide. The wheels had come off for Churchill. He was even booed at a rally in Walthamstow in London. While polling shows that voters still respected and appreciated Churchill's war service, his party was simply too unpopular from the 1930s to win an election in 45. However you slice it, the result was the first Labour majority in history, a majority of 145 seats, something that they've only ever beaten once in an election since. Ultimately, Churchill's warnings on socialism didn't take. Red menace fears had been effective for the Tories in previous elections, as this 1929 poster attests to. Yet, by 1945, public attitudes had changed, meaning, sorry lads, I'm afraid you're a little out of touch. Even Winston Churchill himself had spent the last four years praising the UK's ally, Uncle Joe Stalin. Look, he's even wearing the hat. Wartime propaganda had overlooked Soviet repression and instead emphasised a glorious alliance. 
So when the Conservatives in 1945 tried to tar the Labour Party by association with a scary far left, it was almost uniquely ineffective. Indeed, in the immediate wake of the war, many viewed the USSR as having contributed the most to Germany's defeat and felt that Soviet socialism had been key to their success. The Labour Party was perceived as Britain's own democratic and moderate form of socialism. Ah, oh, come on, YouTube. It's literally Hitler. Still, maybe that's a bit 3D chess for your tastes. A simpler explanation is that since 1940, Labour politicians had already been running many of Britain's home departments, including the Home Office and the Ministry of Labour. To many voters, particularly middle class suburban types, this war record had proved Labour's fitness to govern. Get back here! Moreover, voters had already become accustomed to a great deal of government involvement in their everyday lives as part of the war effort, including the rationing of food and clothing. In this context, Labour's proposal seemed less like an expansion of the state and more like a repurposing of an already large state to serve humanitarian ends. The result was the first Labour majority in history and the beginning of modern British politics. Neat. Can you make my beard and my hair match? No, not like that. Fine. Yet, as Atlee would discover, promising a new Jerusalem is one thing. Actually building it takes something else. Part 4. Nye Bevan and the NHS. This is Ainurin Bevan, or Nye to friends. It's Bevan with an A. Bevan with an I is this guy, Ernest Bevan, also in Atlee's cabinet. They're not to be confused. One of Ernie Bevan. Nye Bevan was a lifelong socialist. He was born in Tredegar, a coal mining town in the valleys of South Wales and began work in the mines at the age of only 13. Imbued with a deep sense of class consciousness, the spirit of community in the Welsh Valleys inspired Bevan with a vision of what British socialism could actually look like. Though it wouldn't have looked... Guys, guys, do you mind? I'm trying to tell them about the sense of community. Oh, back to London. Mind you, it wouldn't have looked like this. This was filmed in California for the 1941 John Ford film, How Green Was My Valley. Look, those are surfing hills. One of the ways the workers of Tredegar banded together was the Tredegar Workmen's Medical Aid Society, a form of private medical insurance that... N no, come back! It's interesting, I promise. Just watch this infomercial. Are you a Welsh miner in 1940s Tredegar? I suppose I am. Then join the Tredegar Medical Aid Fund. For a small contribution from your wages, you and your family will have access to five doctors, one surgeon, two physiotherapists, a dentist and a district nurse. You can get maternity care, false teeth, artificial limbs, and even wigs. All for as little as 3D a week. Whatever that means, that's because our fund is run by its members and uses a progressive funding model. So our richer members subsidize our poorer subscribers. In fact, during the Great Depression, our unemployed members got treatment absolutely free. That's why 95% of Tregeer residents are already subscribed. Join the Tregeer Medical Aid Fund today. Warning, the Tregeer Medical Aid Fund may inspire wider political forms that renders existence obsolete. Bevan had worked with the Tredegar Fund before becoming an MP and was particularly inspired by the way it redistributed wealth among its members. As he would later reportedly tell doctors, All I am doing is extending to the entire population of Britain the benefits we have enjoyed in Tredegar for a generation or more. We are going to Tredegarise you. Hmm. Tredegarisation. I wonder what that's like. <laughs> Yet for all that, when Atlee surprised many by making Bevan his health secretary in 1945, Bevan would quickly forsake the local control that had been central to the Tredegar scheme. It all began in 1946. But... A let's play, Michael. It has to be a let's play. Alex, do you have any idea how long it took to animate not one, but two different let's play scenarios? I different... don't care. We're aging millennials. We have to chase relevancy. Fine. Right, enough kids' games. <laughs> oh yeah! Bevan had been a strong critic, 
of the Conservative members of the War Coalition from the backbenches and become a leader of Labour's left faction. By naming him as Health Secretary, Attlee hoped to use Bevan's talents, but also to mark a break from the War Coalition and stop Bevan undermining the Labour government from the outside. Bevan's first opponent was the Tory opposition. In 1946, he tabled the National Health Service Bill, which tore up the Willink Report and proposed nationalisation of all of Britain's hospitals. Bevan wanted Britain's hospitals run on a regional basis, with each region reporting to the Minister of Health, and he hoped that this system would end regional health inequalities. The Tories opposed the bill, maintaining that they supported a comprehensive healthcare system, but not nationalisation of Britain's hospitals. They tabled a wrecking amendment, but Labour's large majority made passing the bill easy. However, passing the bill was only the start of the battle. Bevan's next opponent was the British medical establishment itself, who were dead opposed to the NHS Act, fearing it would render them little more than civil servants. Sorry civil servants, I don't know what they had against you. In general, Britain's doctors wanted to maintain their independence and avoid becoming state employees. The British Medical Association declared a policy of non-cooperation and even threatened to strike. Bevan couldn't run a hospital service without doctors, so in his own words, he stuffed their mouths with gold. NHS doctors would be allowed to run private practices in their spare time, and there would even be some paid for private beds in NHS hospitals. Plus, general practices, or GPs, wouldn't be nationalised. Instead, they would remain private businesses and paid by the NHS for each patient they had on the books. The doctors relented. Still, there was one person Bevan could never defeat. Himself. At a party rally literally the day before the NHS was due to open, Bevan spoke of his deep, burning hatred for the Tory party, who he described as lower than vermin. The right-wing papers seized on it, overshadowing the first day of the NHS. Clement Attlee was fuming, feeling the speech was needlessly divisive. Though he had already achieved more than most Prime Ministers ever do, Bevan's career would never Futility. fully recover, leaving future left-wingers to dream of what could have been had he ever reached Downing Street. Still, bad press can't argue with results. 75% of the population registered within three months <coughs> And for the most part, they didn't take the piss. Deaths by infectious diseases fell by 80%. Total number of prescriptions given across the country quadrupled to 240 million. And the NHS gave out 33 million dentures in the first year alone. But it wasn't cheap. The government thought the NHS would get cheaper to run as the nation got healthier. In fact, costs only rose as new medical treatments were invented. In at least second term, his government tried to halt rising costs by capping overall NHS spending and charging for the non-essential services of false teeth and glasses. Surprise, surprise, Nye Bevan resigned in protest. Soon after, an internally divided Labour lost power to a now 476-year-old Winston Churchill. Yet, despite Winston's earlier warnings about socialism, when back in power, he kept the new NHS pretty much as was. Realistically, it was too popular to scrap. Give us a hand, would you? That consensus has endured since. Sort of. Alex? I, I thought you were outside. Yeah, you hadn't looked out the window in several months, so I went home. But you haven't answered the big question. Who deserves credit for creating the NHS? It's not really that simple. Just answer the question. Fine. And no more dated references. Okay, okay, I, I promise. Now it's time to play Who Gets right, the okay, Credit? Ready. Start the clock. While he didn't focus primarily on healthcare, William Beveridge deserves a great deal of credit for building consensus in favour of the welfare state. As for the Tories, well, they lose a lot of points for opposing the NHS bill, but they get some back for keeping the system in the 1950s. And finally, in first place, is Labour, who did actually create the NHS. Indeed, it's an achievement both sides of the party had a hand in. The moderates built Labour's reputation during the war years, helping them win power in 1945, and then the more radical Bevan used that opportunity to implement something truly transformational. 
Unfortunately for Labour, in the years since, the party's been less effective at working together. That's because you're a bunch of red Tory scab careerists. No, it's because you're a bunch of self-indulgent Britain-hating morons. Oh, guys, guys, can't you see? You're both right. Still, just focusing on the politicians tells only half the story. Final credit must go to the British public of the 1940s, who came out of the collective suffering of war, determined to build a new society that worked for everyone, not just the individual. While he was undoubtedly a gifted politician, it was ultimately the public's overwhelming support for a new national healthcare system that enabled Nybevan to prevail. Still, with things as they are, perhaps the most important lesson from 1945 is simpler, that sometimes things do get better. Thanks for watching, honourable friends. Stay safe and hope to see you next time. Alex, have you got a final thought too? Hey Michael, your beard looks like the hedge you were dragged through. It's the best argument for mandatory masks. What did you do, steal a nest from a hundred drunken sparrows? If that thing was any bigger and redder, it would have joined the Warsaw Pact. You look like Teen Wolf got stuck. Hey, your chin called. It's scared of the dark. Hey, your girlfriend called. She's scared of you. Hey, your razor called. It's feeling a little rusty. That's not a beard, it's a habitat. If you tried to shave, Greenpeace would stop you. Beard was my thing. Sigh. <sighs>